Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture eight of advanced robotics. So let's see, logistics, uh, main announcements are that your homework two was released last week. It will be due about six days from now, so next week, Wednesday. Then um, other announcement is that uh, Igor Mordach will guest lecture here on Tuesday. Um, Igor is, well, he's done the most advanced nonlinear optimization for optimal control of anybody in the world. So it's really exciting to have him come lecture here and share kind of his like, best expertise in the world about how this can be done. Um, kind of the highest end version is something called contact invariant optimization. And that's one of the main things he'll cover on Tuesday. Let's see, any questions about logistics? Okay, then let's get started. So we had a few things still to wrap up on constraint optimization. The first half of lecture will be on that. Let's do a quick recap of what we looked at. Constraint optimization looked at this type of problem. Minimize some objective function subject to some functions being smaller than zero, which defines a region in the space where you're allowed to be and then subject to some other functions equal to zero, which defines a very narrow sliver of region in the space where you're allowed to be for each of those equations. Then the main formulation we saw is something called penalty formulation. And what it looked like is this. So let me get a pointer. So here's the original problem. And we knew already how to solve unconstrained optimization problems. So now how do we use that to solve constraint optimization problems? Well, we introduced the penalty formulation, the original objective plus some coefficient mu times what is really the sum of the constraints. And these constraints said that the value of g of i of x had to be negative or zero. And we see here we sum in the positive part of that. So if they're negative, it doesn't contribute to the objective. But if it's positive, it retains its value. That's what that absolute value with the plus means. And it contributes to the objective we're trying to minimize. So it's a bad thing. When it's positive, we get penalized. Same thing here. Hj of x was supposed to be 0. If it is 0, it does not contribute to the objective. That's good. If it's not 0, positively contributes to the objective. Now there's a trade-off between these constraint terms and the original objective. And so if mu is a small value, you might um, find an x that is actually not satisfying the constraints because it can do better on the objective by violating the constraints. It'll be penalized, but not enough to get the constraints satisfied. And what will happen in an outer loop is you crank up mu higher, higher, higher until finally the constraints are satisfied. Or maybe you find that there is no local optimum from where you started where the constraints are satisfied. OK, so then from there we kind of broke it down into a detailed algorithm that's actually implementable directly by you know, writing code matching with what's on the slides here. The other thing we saw is that often a tweak used, actually let me go back for a moment. So once we saw this, we said there is a few ways of solving this. One is gradient descent on this objective. And then when you're done, increase mu and repeat. Another one is a quasi-Newton method. When you have optimized for x for a fixed mu, you're done with optimizing for x, you increase mu and repeat, or you could do a trust region method. And the first two are totally fine to run, but a reason that often trust region methods are preferred is because these penalty terms have kind of a, well, a very specific local structure that you can exploit in your inner loop directly rather than just looking at the first order approximation. Because the first order approximation of these penalty terms is not a great approximation per se because those two terms are not locally linear where you, where you want often to be. They're linear and another linear that together form absolute value or linear and horizontal forming the value. Yes, was a question there? Yeah, um, so could you maybe give us a sense of if you were faced with some optimization problem of this form, in what order you would try these methods? So typically, I would imagine that if your problem is relatively low dimensional, um, you try a trust region method. Because essentially, you'll, you'll have solvers, which we'll look at later in this lecture, that will solve the inner part, the trust region approximation of the problem, super quickly. And 
very precisely, and then you'll iterate over mu, and ultimately you'll find a good solution. But these solvers often, um, well, these dedicated solvers often don't scale too well once you have really large problems. And so if you have a really large problem, I don't know, maybe a million variables or something, it also depends on the sparsity and so forth and the constraints, but once you have larger problems, at some point the trust fusion inner loop might become a little too expensive and you might resort to just doing grain descent and hope that you find a reasonable solution that way. And then grain descent typically will be pretty poorly conditioned um, because, well, different variables will contribute differently to the objective. So in practice, it probably wouldn't be gradient descent by the quasi-Newton method. Um, think of gradient descent as something you probably would never really run. You'd probably prefer quasi-Newton because it's about the same cost to run, but we'll scale things better. Now, what happens inside the trust region is this problem is being solved, shown here. This problem approximates the objective with linear approximation, approximates the, what's inside those penalty terms with their <laughs> local linear approximation. By doing that, we actually have something called a convex problem. And convex problems, as we'll see, can be solved very efficiently. And so often, this thing, this trust region local problem is solved with a convex optimization solver unless the dimensions don't allow you to do it. We saw a little more detail about how to do this. And then we said, actually, since we're going to solve the inner loop with a convex optimization solver, why don't we pay a little more care to looking at what actually is now our original problem? Because imagine you had a constraint of the type, constraints lie between negative one, uh, controls lie between negative one and plus one. Well, we can just retain that exactly. We don't need to replace that with anything else. And so anything that's a convex constraint, um, we're just going to keep and feed it directly as is without approximation into the inner loop solver. And so they won't become penalty terms, they're just retained as constraints here and then retained in that inner loop solver. So at this point we've seen that all the outer parts, we've not seen what happens on the inside. When we actually try to solve that problem shown there, how do we solve it very efficiently? Okay, so let's, let's now take a look at that. So convex optimization problems are problems where we have an objective and possibly some inequality constraints, some equality constraints that are convex, meaning every function fi here has to be convex. If a function fi is convex, then it means it's bowl-shaped. And the region where it's smaller than zero is a convex set, where any two points in the set, you take the line between those two points, that entire line lies within the set. And so it's a nicely shaped region of which it's easier to optimize than if there's disjoint uh, sets or non-convex boundaries. AX equal B is a linear constraint. It's our only type of equality constraint. Because once you have nonlinear equality constraints, the region over which the region of feasible points becomes non-convex. Because once you have a curve and you need to be on that curve, then two points on that curve, you connect them with a line, you're not on the curve anymore. And so it's not convex anymore. OK, so but let's, this is now our assumption. So it's a strong set of assumptions. But we've also seen how a problem that doesn't satisfy these assumptions can, in the inner loop, be molded into this. And in the inner loop, we can apply this, even if the outer problem we're solving might be non-convex. It's a quick reminder. So it would look something like this is a convex function in 1D. But the way you test for it in higher dimensions is the same. You take um, a slice in one direction. And you look along that slice, what does the function look like? Does it look such that the line between two points lies above the function? Then it's convex. If not, it's not convex. If it's a 2D function, you can draw contours. But in general, that's not going to be possible. But if it is 2D, you can look at it, and the contours will be convex. Now, we have to deal with two things. We have to deal with equality constraints and inequality constraints. So. Let's first deal with the equality constraints and ignore the inequality constraints, and then we'll look at the inequality constraints uh, separately. So then the problem is of this form. Minimize over x f of x such that ax equals b. And we'll see three different solution methods. Elimination, Newton's method, and infeasible start Newton method. The, there might be different benefits to them depending on what type of problem you're solving. Um, so we'll cover all three. Don't think of one as better than the other. It's just different situations might have different methods be the right fit. 
Um, OK, so method one is elimination. When you have a set of equations, x such that ax equal b, kind of the canonical thing that you might have seen as well, number of equations equal to number of variables, and there is a single solution. And then actually the optimization problem is not that interesting. It's just that one single solution is the optimum of your optimization problem. You're done. Usually in optimization problems, and then the other thing you might have seen is least square. So we have a bunch of equations, and there's no x that satisfies all of them. You try to find the x that's as close as possible to satisfying all of them. Here we're in the opposite regime. We're in a regime where um, there's less equations than unknowns. So there will be a set of solutions. So ax equal b, less equations than unknowns. There will be a set of solutions. When that's the case, linear algebra tells us there will be a set x such that x equals x hat, which is one solution. You just find one solution to the set of equations, plus f times z, where f is a matrix. And z can be any vector then of the right dimensions. And so um, how do you get this? Um, well, f needs to span the null space of A, meaning f is something where if you take a linear combination of the columns of A, any such linear combination of the, oh, sorry, any linear combination of the columns of f, you multiply that with A, you get 0. So we'll have A times f times z always equal to 0. How do we find this f? Um, one simple thing you could do is compute a single value decomposition of A. So single value decomposition will say A equals, and let me draw a quick picture here, A is, in this case, a fat matrix, right? Whereas in least squares, which we are probably more used to seeing, it would be a skinny matrix. But here we have a, a fat matrix, less equations than unknowns. This is A. And this will be equal to U sigma, or we'll call it S there, times V transpose, and this one will only have entries on this diagonal here. It's not a square matrix, it's kind of a funny diagonal, but it'll only have non-zero entries here, which are the singular values. This will be an orthogonal matrix. This will be an orthogonal matrix, meaning U, U transpose equal identity, and same V, V transpose equal identity, same for V transpose V, and U transpose U. So that's single value decomposition, which if you, if you actually don't remember, I highly recommend you restudy it, because it's probably the most important concept in linear algebra. Um, and what we're saying is that essentially when we multiply, we want to find solution to ax equal b. We already found a solution x hat. We know a x hat equals b. What we're claiming is that we can find other solutions of the type a x hat plus delta x equal b. And that these solutions can be found by essentially looking at this matrix V here and realizing that if you have a vector x or x plus delta x, say x hat plus delta x, we're multiplying with V transpose, then the only thing that gets passed through, because these are the only, here we have non-zero, but below it, it's all zeros. So the only thing that will get passed through is what goes into the first set of rows of V transpose. If your vector x has a non-zero inner product with these rows, that will get passed through. That will have an effect on the outcome. We need to be careful we can't do that, because that will make it not be anymore. But anything that has zero inner product with the top and non-zero with the bottom here will be passing through like nothing changed, and you'll still get B on the other side. And what is this? Well, this is, this is V transpose. So really what this is, the last rows of V transpose, the last columns of V. This is the last set of columns of V that span, that are the basis for the things that we can add to the one solution we already have, x hat. And so that's what we can do. We do single value decomposition. We grab these rows, which we'll think of as columns now, and that is our F matrix. So this here is F transpose, lives down here. That's it. That's all we need. OK. What are some benefits? Well, one benefit is actually you reduce the dimensionality of the problem you're solving. You used to solve over 
your optimization over x space, and z will be smaller, lower dimensional than x, so you now solve a lower dimensional problem. And sometimes that's pretty convenient uh, to do. Um, then often the number of constraints is not that high, then it will not reduce the dimensionality much. You might not care much for that. Um, potential downsides, you first need to solve AX equal B and find the null space of A, for example, through single value decomposition or other methods. Then that will give you F. And another big downside is probably the biggest one that why people usually don't use this method is bullet point three. This elimination might destroy the sparsity of A. So very often when you set up an optimization problem, you might have a high dimensional variable x that you're optimizing over, but the way it participates in constraints and in the objective is very sparse. So the matrix A would have mostly zero entries. And even if your matrix A has mostly zero entries, your matrix F will typically be dense. And so all of a sudden you're dealing with a competition much more expensive problem even though reduced, you reduce the dimensionality. And so if of course, if A is not sparse when you start out with, there's no reason to, to worry about this, but most practical problems, A will be sparse, and so three will be the issue, and you will not want to do it this way. Any questions about this? So mathematically, we have a way of solving the problem. It's just that we know that in practice, often we're not going to want to do it this way, because often A will be sparse. Um, what else can we do? Let's think geometrically about the problem. We're minimizing some function f of x, in this case over two-dimensional space, so we can draw a picture. We see the contours there of f of x. Um, and if there was no constraint, we'd want to land right in the middle over here. But there is a constraint. ax has to be equal to b. So it can only be on this line over here. Well, can we geometrically think about what it means to be an optimum? We have to be on the line. And which point on the line is going to be correct? Well, the reason this point is correct is from here, the gradient points orthogonal to that line. So what do we move to the left or the right? We don't get any improvement because the inner product with the gradient will be 0. Whereas for all other points, when we're further out, the gradient will be telling us to move in. And here, the gradient again will tell us to move in along the line. And it stops where the gradient is orthogonal to that line. And so the optimality condition then becomes um, we are at a constraint optimization problem optimum in this case whenever the gradient is orthogonal to um, the line. In this case, in general, the, the plane or hyperplane on which you need to live. What does that mean? Um, well, we'll do the bottom one here first. For the gradient to be orthogonal to that plane, what does it mean to be orthogonal to the plane? Well. The way you define that plane is by a set of vectors living in A. And you say A times x has to be equal to 0, meaning that x has, or equal to b. So what it means is A, the vectors in A span what is orthogonal to the plane. And we want the gradient to be orthogonal to the plane. So it means the gradient should be aligned with whatever are the vectors that live inside A, because they define orthogonality to each of the planes that you need to be in. So that's this condition here. You can also write it this way for all delta x that we can apply to x if um, a times delta x equals 0 means we remain feasible because we start with a feasible we're trying to check if we're optimum if a change remains feasible then for that change we have to be orthogonal to the gradient so these are two equivalent conditions now one way to solve the problem is to just look at those conditions say can I find a um, x and a mu such that the gradient equals this thing, or can I find a um, x such that a delta, whenever a delta x equals 0, this is true. Um, maybe sometimes we can. Let's see what we can do. So optimality conditions we're going to work with is that we want ax star equal b and the gradient to be spanned by the columns of a. All right, so how do we do this? Sometimes you can do this analytically. So for some small problems, sometimes you can write this out and you can say, okay, this is just a solution, closed form, you're done. And then that's great. That, that's very convenient. Most of the time, it's not going to work. So we can actually extend Newton's method to this scenario. Here's what we do. We say optimality conditions are here. 
Let's assume we have a feasible x. So there's an assumption. We will relax that assumption later. Let's assume we have a feasible x. So we already solved ax equal b of some x, not the optimal x, but ax. Then we can use a second order approximation of the function f in this optimization problem here. So now we have this formulation over here. Now for the second order approximation of the problem, we can write out the optimality conditions, which will give us this over here. So this is if we assume that our problem was actually a second order problem, which it is not, but if it were, then this would be the equations we need to satisfy. And because it's a second order approximation, we take the gradient to get those conditions. That becomes a linear system of equations. And all we need to do is solve a linear system of equations to satisfy the optimality conditions of the local approximation to the real problem, the Newton approximation to the real problem. And then once we've done that, we can take a step. We're in a new spot. We take the new second order approximation and repeat. So computationally, this is very feasible. It's very similar to Newton's method. Um, whenever Newton's method applies to the um, original problem without constraint, then you should be able to also run this uh, when there is the equality constraint. Maybe the only caveat, oh, let's, let's give the full algorithm. So this would be the full algorithm. It's essentially Newton's method all over, except that the Newton step is now obtained by solving this particular problem over here. What if there are no constraints? What happens? Then the A matrix is non-existent. So these parts disappear, the mu disappears, and we just have the standard Newton step. Hessian times delta x that we're trying to find is equal to negative the gradient. Um, so it nicely simplifies to what we already know. But if there is an equality constraint set, then we have this added to it. Now, you might say, I'd prefer not to first solve the system of equations to have a feasible starting point. Can we do that? Just have a feasible start uh, method. Actually, we can. You can use the exact same idea. So remember our original optimization problem up here, our optimality condition over here. Then we can do the first order approximation of the optimality condition at the current x, shown here. And then we just solve that. So what's different between what we do here and what we did before? If x were feasible, then a times x will be equal uh, to b. And so this thing over here, b minus ax, would be 0. And we have the um, original thing that we had on the previous slide, where we have a 0 at the bottom here. Um, but that's the only difference. So essentially, the same amount of computation has to happen. It's just that you now have a b minus ax there, because we don't have a feasible x yet. And over time, it'll find something feasible. Sometimes that's OK, sometimes that's not OK. Imagine you're solving an optimal control problem. You're iteratively solving it, but you might run out of time. And if your solution has to be feasible to be able to apply it, then you might not like this, because as long as you're not converged, you might not have reached the feasible point. And you might prefer to first find a feasible point and stay feasible at all times. And so it depends on the situation you're in, whether you really care about feasibility every step along the way. Now, well, you just care about feasibility once you're converged. And if you're willing to wait till you're converged, then you know, there's no reason to first solve for a feasible x. You can just run this. OK, any questions about equality constrained um, convex problems and how we solve them? Yes? OK, so the question is, how do we get this second optimality condition? Let's go back to the uh, drawing here. So there's two conditions. The first one is just a constraint. So that's given to us. We don't have to work to get that. The second one is saying the gradient of the function has to point in a direction that's orthogonal to how we can move in the plane. So it's saying gradient orthogonal to how we can move in the plane. So this is the plane we can move in. Gradient has to be orthogonal. And why, why is that what it is? Imagine, I mean, this is a 2D problem, and so it's just a line. So there's just a single vector living in A. It's just two numbers living in A. A1, A2, let's say we have A times x equals B. That vector A, that vector A for AX equal B actually points orthogonal to this plane. That's, that's how it works to define a plane or a line. It's the, the vector that sits there lives orthogonal to the line itself. Essentially, what it's doing is saying 
that vector is saying, in the direction A, you need to be a distance B out. And so you need to be a distance B out in direction A. So then at some point, your distance B out and everything orthogonal to A is on that line, satisfies the condition, everything else does not. And so A points orthogonal to that line. And we want our grain to be orthogonal to the line. So that's what we have there. We say our grain has to be orthogonal, has to, be orthogonal to the line, which means in the same direction as A. Now, when there is multiple constraints, multiple planes in a higher dimensional space, for each plane, you can say this, my, it's OK if my gradient is aligned with the A for that specific plane. But it's actually OK to be aligned with any one of the A's, but not just any one of the A's, also any linear combination of those A's. And that's what this condition is saying. Because imagine you have two planes together. They define a line. It's actually, turns out it's arbitrary which two planes you use to define that line. And, and the math works out so that if you take just the two vectors you originally had to define those two planes, you can take any linear combination, and that will be everything orthogonal to that line. And that will be how you want your gradient to be pointing. And then from here, just to quickly recap, what we conclude is essentially that even though this condition in general you cannot solve for exactly, if your problem is a second order optimization problem, you can solve it exactly. So we're going to just turn to a second order, solve it exactly, and repeat. If we start feasible, everything will stay feasible every step along the way. If we start infeasible, it will gradually move towards um, feasible. OK, now on to inequality constraints. So we're still trying to solve a convex optimization problem. So what an inequality constraint would look like is something like drawn in red here. It's a region where if you take two points in the region, you connect them with a line, you're still in that region. For this problem here, if it was not constrained, the optimum would be in the middle of that set of contours here. But it is constrained. You have to lie inside this region. So um, the optimal point will be here. We want to be essentially, it's always going to, for a situation like this, it's going to be on the boundary here, right where it can get to the lowest possible contour it can probably reach within that set it's in. Now, one thing you might wonder is, um, you know, why, why do we treat the inequality constraints and the equality constraints separately? Because, um, I mean, one thing you could say is, well, um, isn't it the case that I can just say, well, um, if I have AX equal B, I have AX small equal to B, AX bigger than or equal to B, and I can just turn one equality constraint into two inequality constraints and have the same problem. But it turns out that the way we're going to deal with the inequality constraints in this case is quite different. And it wouldn't really work if we phrase our original problem this way. We have to keep our equality constraints uh, the way they are. All right, now let's take a look at um, how we deal with this. There's actually quite a few methods that can deal with uh, solving this kind of problem. We're going to see a specific method called uh, a barrier method. And then later, I'll, I'll point you to some other methods um, that you might want to check out on your own at some point. So let's raise that. The problem we want to solve is min over x f zero of x subject to fi of x small and equal to 0. And I'm going to ignore the equality constraints here. Um, we can bring them back in using the methods we already have later. We're going to actually do something somewhat similar to what we did with the penalty method. But it's not going to be the same ultimate solution. But we're going to say, well, this is a constraint optimization problem. But constraint optimization problems are hard to deal with. Let's see if we can turn it into an unconstrained problem. Well, what could we do? We can say, instead, 
minimize over x, f0 of x stays the same, plus sum over all constraints of i negative fi of x. Now remember, with the penalty method, we had something similar where we had this absolute positive part of the uh, function. Here it's something different. What is this indicator negative thing? It means that if, if what's inside is negative, we make it zero. So it will not influence the objective because we, then we're satisfying the constraint. We don't have to worry about it. But if it's positive, we make it infinity. OK, so then this is kind of crazy, but that's what we're going to do. So we're going to say our function, if this is f i of x living on this axis, and on this axis we have i negative of f i of x, this function will be 0 here, and then jump to infinity over here. Now, let's think about this. If we do this, does this problem have the same solution as this problem? Well, it does. And why does it? Because whenever the constraints are satisfied, it will not influence the objective anymore. And so it doesn't influence the objective. Well, then we're just optimizing this function. And that's what we need to do when we're uh, feasible. What happens when we're infeasible? One of these fi of x's is bigger than 0. Well, what happens then is that this thing will be infinity. It makes us very unhappy in the minimization, and we'll definitely not declare the solution. So these two problems have the same optimum. OK. Um, why don't we like this formulation? The reason we don't like it is because it's a very poorly conditioned problem. If you think about it, like you're optimizing this function f0 of x, you're moving around. And then once you step a little too far, all of a sudden you're infinity and you didn't see it coming at all. And now it's bad and actually it doesn't even tell you which direction to move. It's like infinity everywhere where you landed now. There's no signal anymore about what to do. Compare that to penalty method, which we saw where it would actually have a slope going like this. And then yes, when you cross the boundary, you'd be unhappy, but gradually unhappy and know to move back to the boundary. Here, we're not doing that. We're in this formulation, making an infinity, but hence that also doesn't really work because you don't get any signal on where to move. The question is, can we approximate this? How about if we have a function that maybe is running this way? And goes to infinity, but gradually. And so now you'll see it coming. As you move closer to where you're not allowed to be, you'll get more and more gradient force pushing you back in. So you could take a function that does this. I'll give you a function. Um, let's see. Um, log of minus fi of x will look like this. I mean, I'm not saying it's, I mean, it's going to be cleaner than what I drew. But the log, remember, log function, the way you're used to seeing it is this way. We're now flipping what's on the inside. So it's negative, so it comes on the other side. Not, it's not living there anymore. It's living on this side now. And then actually the other thing we're doing, we're actually putting a negative sign in front to flip it the other way. So essentially flipped it this way. And after we flipped it to this side, we then flipped it vertically. And we end up with this function over here, which is this function here is log minus log of negative x. So that function has the right properties. It goes to infinity at 0, so you don't want to, I mean, it's maybe not ideal ideal because you say, well, I'm allowed to be 0. But you know what? It's maybe fine. If you can be just epsilon away from 0, it's, it's good enough. Um, so it goes to infinity there. Um, so you, you want to stay away from it, and you get signal. Now, the tricky part is that it does have quite a bit of signal, and it'll kind of keep you maybe too far away from the boundary. You might say, well, anywhere here, I'm probably never going to end up. It's just too high cost in this new problem. So if I write min 
x, which is the new formulation, min x f0 x plus, well, minus, because we have a negative sign in front of it. Let's just do plus sum over i 1 through m, negative log of minus fi of x. Will be kept away too far from the boundary to truly find the optimum? Yes, question. Uh, when you, if, you're, if you output an x that does cross over to the positive axis? You're not allowed to. <laughs> In this method, you're not allowed to. And actually, when you, this is a really good question. Um, if, look, you can already imagine that we're going to run a gradient method on this new objective or something like a gradient method, Newton's method, and so forth. And if you take your step size too large on this new objective and you land on the other side, your backtracking line search, part of the backtracking line search has to be backtracking when it tells you infinity. And so consider it's still infinity past here, or it'll give you not a number or something in practice, or a complex number, because a log of a negative number will be a complex number, if, depending on the implementation you're using. Then you've got to check for that. And definitely it's a kind of common thing that can go wrong. You don't check for it, and then all of a sudden everything's complex numbers in your optimization, and you wonder where they came from. Well, they came from the fact that you took the log of a negative number and they just start showing up. Um, so that's, that's something to be really careful with, absolutely. And so it's the backtracking line search supposed to catch that. It also turns out that for convex problems, there are certain guarantees. So there are certain guarantees that um, if you apply Newton steps, that it will actually not, for the right kind of function living here, and log is one of them, there are other options, but log is one of them, that you will, your Newton step will not get you beyond the barrier. It'll automatically keep you on the inside. So you would not have that issue. Um, but if you use gradient, gradient method rather than Newton's method, then the step size is somewhat arbitrary because we know when you rescale the problem, you get a different step size just by, the, by rescaling the problem. So then you don't necessarily have those guarantees. You need to be very careful. So, this problem will have a different solution from this one or this one, because these have the same solution. These two, one and two are equivalent. Three gives us a different solution. But can we get closer? Well, the way we can get closer by saying, well, minus log minus fi of x. What if I actually rescale this? What if I put a minus one over t for t a positive number of log minus fi of x? What happens? Well, let's think about it. If t is 1, we have what we had before. Now let's make t bigger, which brings us to a coefficient in front of this, bringing this closer to 0. So this function here then will run closer to 0. It'll still cross over always at where the inner thing is 1. Then after here, it'll stay closer to 0 and shoot up later. And the bigger we make t, the more we are really multiplying with something close to zero, and the more this function will be very close to being exactly zero here, just li slightly below, and then slightly above here, and then only at the very end shoot up. So we can then say, well, OK, we got it. Just set t equal some large number. And then the problem will be almost equivalent to the original problem. If you make t really large, like infinity, then you're actually back to problem two. So the limit of t going to infinity, you get problem two. But we also know in problem two, we get no signal. And so your intuition should tell you that, well, actually what we should be doing is not just set t really large, because the larger t, the less signal we get in our optimization. So what we're going to do is something gradual. Start with a t that's pretty small. We get more signal about the shape, how your optimization problem is shaped especially the constraints, because that's where it comes in. And then as you solve it, for a small, um, initially for a small t, you've solved it, you make your t larger, repeat, repeat, repeat. So just like in a penalty method, we're driving up mu. Here we're going to be driving up t. Um, funniest notation, uh, for some reason, the way the notation is here is like t will be mu times t in every iteration, whereas before we had mu equals t times mu. It was just standard notation that different literatures kind of, I guess, mix up um, the t and the mu and use it for the opposite thing. OK, so any questions about this? This is probably the, the main idea for the first half of lecture.
All right, let's look at some results then when using this. So here's the slide showing the thing we had on the board. Let's zoom in on that plot. As um, t becomes larger, this thing gets closer and closer to horizontal first and vertical later. It's called the barrier method. Why? Because you put up this barrier that you're not supposed to go past. So you're supposed to start on the inside of it and never go past that barrier. And it keeps you from escaping because it gets it's pretty steep. Um, what does it look like? OK. You do a centering step, it's called. You compute x star t, which means the optimal solution for this surrogate problem here. It's not the real problem, it's a surrogate problem, but it's close to the real problem. Solve this problem, and you can still have equality constraints. We know how to deal with that. So now it's just a convex problem with equality constraints. No inequalities anymore. It's not the original problem, but at least it's related. Once we found x star for that specific choice of t, we check the stopping criterion. Essentially, if our t has become really, really large, then we're ready to stop because we have pretty much uh, the original problem. If it's not that large yet, then we increase t by a factor mu and repeat. Here is uh, this applied to um, solving linear programs, which is linear objective and linear inequality constraints and linear equality constraints. Um, this was done with Newton's method. So Newton iteration is so shown on the horizontal axis. Duality gap is distance from optimality measured in a specific way. Um, it's on the vertical axis, logarithmic scale. And we see we get this kind of quadratic conversions just like we had with unconstrained problems. And we see it's you know, not super sensitive to the choice of mu, but mu in the range of 10 to 200 seems to be um, Reasonable, if you go below 10, that's the, the graph on the right, if you go below 10, the number of iterations you need to get to uh, meet your optimality criterion is very large. 140 here versus just 20 here. So mu, set mu larger than 10 uh, for this kind of problem. Um, here's another one, a geometric program, which is another convex program um, where you have log some exp in the objective and log some exp in the constraints. Um, you can run same uh, method and again converges in a very small number of iterations. Um, standard form LPs can be solved this way. What's interesting is that it doesn't really um, slow down. So M is on the horizontal axis counting the number of constraints. And the speed of solving this in terms of number of um, iterations needed, it doesn't go up much with the number of constraints. Um, so it's fairly invariant the number of constraints, uh, how fast you can get centered. Initialization might be something you worry about, because for this thing, we cannot be outside of the barrier. We need to be on the inside. How do we do that? Well, here's a simple trick. You solve this other problem first, which is called phase one. Um, original problem was you needed these to be satisfied in ax equal b. Well, you can just say, I'm choose some arbitrary x. Whatever, I, I, I pick something. I then check, um, what is fi of x for each fi? I see which one is the largest. I set s equal to the largest one. And now I say, OK, now I have a new problem where I'm going to start minimizing s from that starting point. But I start feasible. So what I, what I did is I said, I want to find, in some sense, the most feasible point. right? Because minimizing s means you might bring this below 0. If you cannot bring it to 0, then it's just an infeasible problem. But if you can bring this below 0, you're kind of in the most feasible part of the space, the centered part of the space, ignoring the objective. You just want to get centered. And so this one we can solve very effectively because we can initialize by just making s large enough. And then we're good to go. So that's a little trick here is we replace the 0 on the right-hand side by a s, make it large enough. Find the things that's most centered, and then we can start the phase 2, the actual optimization. Having just one s here is one way to do it. You could also have a different s for every constraint. Um, that way you're kind of paying more attention in some sense to constraints that are um, uh, harder to satisfy and it might be slightly better conditioned. Um, ultimately, um, when you do this, the, the main advantage of doing it this way is that if your problem is infeasible, it does not have a solution, it'll help you identify which constraints are causing the trouble and making it not possible to be satisfied. And you can go back and say, well, 
is this even a problem I should be trying to solve because apparently it's not feasible to satisfy all the constraints. You can change the problem you're trying to solve and go again. Okay, so what are some other methods for convex problems? Um, what we covered is a primal interior point method or a barrier method. What it means is that we're always in the interior of the feasible set while we run this method. It's primal because we only pay attention to the x variable. We know when there's constraints, you can form a Lagrangian which introduces dual variables, and we don't pay attention to those in this method. So that's one of several ways of solving this kind of problem. Um, there are other methods that people use that are, I would say, a little more intricate, um, but they could be of interest to you at some point. Um, primal dual interior point methods is where you have the same thing happen both in primal and dual space. So you have a feasible dual space, a feasible primal space, and you solve for both variables at the same time. Um, then primal dual infeasible interior point methods, essentially, um, they will say, I still need to be feasible in terms of the inequality constraints, but my equality constraints I can violate, like we saw before, with the just equality constraints setup, and that's what they will do. So there's a few different um, ways of, of solving these kinds of problems. One of the reasons you might care about solving the dual at the same time is because there is a property that says that the primal problem will be this convex ball, the dual problem will in some sense be this like oppositely shaped ball living below it, and at the optimum they will touch. And so as you check in your dual space what your value is, it's taking the primal space where your function value is, the difference between them is the upper bound on how far away you are from the real optimum. And so by solving both the primal and dual at the same time, we actually get this information about how far away you are from optimum, which is often nice to have. Any questions about the barrier method? Then the other thing we covered at the end last time was dual descent. Um, this is yet another way to solve a constraint optimization problem um, shown in the top right here. What I didn't have on the slide last time was the explicit update. Like in dual descent, you optimize over x. Once you're done optimizing over x for current choice of lambda and mu, you update them with gradient descent, which is just as simple as actually gradient ascent because it's maximizing. Um, it's just these updates over here. That's all you have to do for the dual variables. And then you solve again for x and repeat. The thing I alluded to and also didn't have on the slide is the bottom part here is that um, this is the original problem. This is a new equivalent problem with the same solution. If g i of x is to be smaller than 0, then the positive part of g i of x has to be smaller than 0. If h g of x has to be equal to 0, then the absolute value of h g of x has to be equal to 0. So then we can form a Lagrangian for this problem, which gives us this thing over here. And now all of a sudden, it looks a lot like a penalty formulation. Um, if you run dual descent, we have these additive updates to each of the dual variables. When we run penalty formulation, we just have a single dual variable in some sense mu that we just scale up periodically. Other than that, they're essentially the same at this point. One of the places dual descent is um, used a lot is when you have just um, a very small number of constraints. Like you might have maybe, um, for example, a recent place where it, it's, it's used is um, trust vision policy optimizations. We'll cover a few lectures down the line. Say you want your policy to stay close to where it used to be. There's a constraint about that. Well, if you want to satisfy that constraint, but you don't have the ability to run this kind of full optimization machinery. You just want to run gradient descent on the original problem. This is what it allows you to do. You can keep your original problem. You add your constraint. Just run gradient descent on your original problem. And we know that if this lambda is set correctly, you're solving the correct problem anyway. And so you're just doing gradient descent on this and then periodically tweak your lambda to ensure you're actually solving the problem you're supposed to be solving. And so it's a way to stay close to the problem that was unconstrained in everything you're doing just with periodically, you need to do like a slight adjustment to the objective uh, to tweak it to make sure you're solving the constraint problem. 
And so um, and TRPO, effectively, what it led to, and we'll see some of these things later, is that you know, TRPO is a second-order method, effectively, which makes it hard to apply to large-scale problems at times. PPO, proximal policy optimization, will essentially do something close to this, where you would just um, adjust the, the Lagrange multiplier in front of the constraint, and everything else can remain first order all of a sudden and much more scalable. OK, let's take a couple minutes break here. And then after the break, we'll look at optimization-based optimal control. All right, let's restart. So at this point, we know how to solve constraint optimization problems. And we can revisit them now, the problem we originally wanted to solve, which is optimal control. It turns out there's many ways to formulate an optimal control problem as an optimization problem. So the key thing we're going to cover for the second half here is a breakdown of formulations. Because once it's formulated, we already have solution methods. It's all about the formulation now. So there is two types of formulations in terms of um, the first axis is shooting and collocation. So the difference between shooting and collocation is whether in shooting, you directly optimize over the controls and don't really pay much attention to the state variables you encounter along the way. Whereas in collocation, you optimize for both at the same time. Let me make this more con concrete. And for now, we'll do this to return open loop controls. So what we'll return is a sequence of controls, u0, u1, Till UH. Because that's our optimal control problem. Can we find a sequence of controls that optimizes our cost? Shooting will be minimize over U0, U1, up to UH. The cost for being in state X0 at time 0 and taking control of U0, plus the cost for being in state x1 at time 1 
and taking action U1, but we're not having X as our optimization variables in a shooting method. So really what we'll have here is we'll have cost for F, which is the dynamics of X0 comma U0, which is X1, but we don't put it in the optimization. We eliminate those variables and control U1. Then plus the cost for being in state X2, taking control of U2, but again, we don't have X here in the shooting method. We have only U variables, so it'll be F of F of X0, U0, U1, U2, and so forth. That's a shooting approach. The collocation approach, and we'll talk about benefits and, and um, downsides in a moment, collocation approach would say, you know what, I'm just gonna keep the X variables around. So I'm just gonna say minimize over U0, X0, I should phrase it the other way, X0, U0, X1, U1 all the way till XH, UH, the sum T equals zero through H of the cost of XT, UT, subject to XT plus one equals F of XT comma UT. Because Xs cannot be arbitrarily chosen, we have to choose them to satisfy the constraints. There could be other constraints like U's have to line some boundaries and so forth, um, but let's not worry about writing those up. So let's, let's think about first, if we solve this problem or this problem, the optimal solution is gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be the same sequence of controls. There's no difference. And we have optimization methods at our disposal, so why would you even care about different formulations, one versus the other? Well, think back about these optimization methods. When they work well, don't work well. Typically the issue with um, optimization methods is when they're poorly conditioned. Some variables have much more influence than other variables in complicated ways and so forth. Well, that's gonna happen here. It's gonna happen very directly because U0 is coming in everywhere and U0 has an effect on what the final state is going to be. Imagine you're controlling a car and U0 is saying how much you steered to the left or right in the very beginning. Well, that'll have tremendous influence on where you end up at the end. If you steered 90 degrees to the left in the beginning, you'd have a completely different place than if you did not do that. And so shooting methods in general um, are gonna be poorly conditioned, pretty much by design, hence difficult optimization problems to solve. Doesn't mean they're not solvable. I mean, we have second order methods you can deal with it at times, but it's typically gonna be harder to solve. What's the upside? Well, if your state space is very high dimensional, imagine you work, I don't know, in image space. You have a F function that goes from image to next image to next image, well, then your X variables will be huge. There'll be one megapixel images of a million variables at every time. Then, well, if you have to keep them around explicitly, then maybe it's harder to deal with. Um, so the dimensionality of X might affect whether you can afford a collocation method or not, especially when U is low dimensional, it might be convenient to keep the problem as a whole low dimensional that you optimize over. The collocation method nicely decouples. What was the effect of U0? Well, the effect of U0 doesn't propagate anywhere into the future. If you use constraint optimization the way we've seen it, well, all that'll happen, let's say you use a penalty method, is that if you look at the terms that, that appear in the penalty method, is that U0 just appears in the very first constraint, and that's it. It does not have any effect on anything that happens later. And so the X variables decouple the optimization problem, typically make it a lot better conditioned than if you do this kind of you know, propagation through time of all the controls and effects they have in the future. Now, this in both cases is solving for U's. You can actually do the same thing solving for feedback policies. Let's say we wanna return pi theta, a feedback policy, maybe linear feedback controller, k times x or k times x plus some offset k, or maybe a neural network, pi theta, you want to find a parameter theta, we can do the exact same thing. And we can again do shooting or collocation. Um, both can be done. So shooting would be min over theta, because now theta is the only thing we optimize over. Cost for x0 and taking 
action <coughs> u0 at time 0, but u0 is not a variable right now. It's just pi theta of x0 plus, actually, I'm going to move this up to have a little more space. So min over theta c of x0 pi theta x0 plus same thing as over here, except that we replace the u1 with pi theta of x1 and we replace u0 by pi theta of um, x0. So f of x0 comma pi theta of x0 comma pi theta of x1 plus another cost and so forth. Here I have wrote three terms out of the many, many terms here I only wrote two. And we can do collocation. Um, and actually there's two ways to do collocation. Um, so let me give you both. One way to do it is to say, I'm gonna do it exactly um, with this set of equations. I'm just gonna say um, minimize over the axis 0 through h and theta, sum of the costs, cost at each time, for state at that time and control applied at that time, subject to xt plus 1 equals f of xt comma pi theta of xt. You can do it differently. You can say, why don't we collocate even more? That's fine too. You can say, why not just keep the u variables around also? Because maybe this pi theta is kind of constraining you. The function form of pi theta doesn't give you the flexibility you want, and you want to make your u something else. You want to kind of make your optimization things a little easier when you start out. You can say, well, minimize over x0 through xh, u0 through uh, and theta. Same thing, t equals zero to h, but now the cost is in terms of xt and ut, and then the constraints are xt plus one equals f of xt comma ut, and ut has to be pi theta of xt. And so in this optimization, when you run it this way, at times your controls that you optimize over, your uts will not satisfy this, your penalty method will only at the end get this satisfied, but it might give you more freedom in terms of initially finding what sequence of controls could be good. So these are four different formulations, and all are solving this, well, that one's solving for feedback policy, this one's solving for open loop, but ultimately all three on the, on the right and solve the same problem, all two on the left solve the same problem. The difference is in conditioning, and size of the variables that you're dealing with when you're running this. There's a third axis of choice. Um, you might say, well, um, open loop controls seem a little fragile. Like I find open loop control and then um, I start executing, but a little bit of noise in the system and it will not be valid anymore. Well, what you can do on top of this, you can then, during rollout, Just use u0 through uh, that's the naive thing, or you can do something called model, model position control, MPC. Uh, let me spell it out, model predictive control. What does that mean? It means that after you took your first step, you just solve the optimization problem again from time one, and then take another step and solve it again, again, again. And so that's the way to, even though you solve for open loop controls, you're still applying a feedback policy. Is after every step, you check what happened and find the optimum relative to where you landed. And that's exactly what it means to do feedback control. It's just that it's not in a, in a parametric form. It's by you having to resolve every time. Now, you can also do that here. And because it could be that your pi theta is somewhat restrictive, that you feel like, okay, it's not as fine-tuned to the situation as I want it to be. It's just more of a starting point, and you can actually take a first step, 
and resolve for the best pi theta for the horizon that remains and repeat, repeat, repeat. That's not done very often. In fact, I would say it's rarely done, but in principle, it's an option you have available to you if you want to do it. Now, what are some issues of this thing over here? This thing, when you are optimizing for these U's, what really happens? Um, well, two things will happen. One is, if you look at your derivatives, U0 appears in so many places, you actually see a lot of shared computation. We want to do something more efficient that compute every derivative independently. We want to do something called back propagation through time. I'll have a slide on illustrating that. But the idea is that you'll do shared calculations. So anything that reappears as a component that you need to find derivatives with respect to the mu, the mu entries, you'll do in a shared way, dynamic programming way, to minimize computation cost. So that's one thing that you need to do here. Otherwise, it gets super expensive very quickly. But if you set it up in something like TensorFlow or uh, any kind of automatic differentiation package will automatically do that dynamic programming for you and it'll be very easy. But it is something that's important, otherwise it won't work. At least computation will be too expensive. There's another thing that's tricky, is that you find your current controls, as will happen in optimization. What will happen next? You'll essentially have to roll this out over time, do a back propagation backwards, to find the derivatives, and then you can do your optimization step. Or maybe Newton's step, you need also Hessians, but it's a gradient method, just a back relation step, you get your gradient, do an update. Tricky thing is that even during this rollout, there could be, even if there's no actual noise in the system, it could be numerical instabilities leading to small things going differently, and also what happens, because this is all nonlinear functions, you get instability in your rollout. And so even your, op your optimization actually doesn't work. What's the fix to that? The fix to that is to then run MPC in the inner loop of your optimization. So this becomes very uh, intense, but you would say, I have a current U to roll it out, because I want to find gradients. To find gradients, I need to roll out into a back propagation. To roll it out, I can't just roll out the U that I currently have. I have to do MPC as I roll out. Once I've done that, I have a good rollout. Then I can do back propagation through that rollout, do an update, and repeat. And so that's one way to make this stable. And without it, often it's just not going to work. If you have an unstable dynamical system, this formulation will not work unless you do something to take care of stabilization in the forward pass. Um, let's see. Let's do a, a, a roundup of, of what's different between the different methods. Shooting, you improve the control sequence over time. I said a lot of not so great things about it, making it difficult, but actually one great thing about this or this is that at all times you're feasible. As you're optimizing, you have a feasible solution. Something you can actually use. You could use that sequence of controls or you could use that feedback policy you found so far. When you're in the bottom category, the collocation method, um, it might be that some of your controls are infeasible or incompatible with uh, things that um, you need to satisfy in your constraint set. and so. You actually don't know how well you're doing. Like when you're running the bottom ones, you'll have a score, but that score will be a combination of cost as well as penalty from violating constraints. And well, if you violate the constraints, it's just a penalty in your optimization. But in the real world, you don't know what's going to happen. If you violate your dynamics somewhere, you say, "Well, yeah, in this step, I'm just going to violate the dynamics. It's fine. And, you know, it's a small. It's, it's just a penalty." But that penalty is not actually quantifying what's going to happen when you take that control and propagate it forward in time and how this rollout is going to play out. So you'll have no, no real notion of how well your current thing is doing. Only once all penalties have gone to zero will you know, oh, it's feasible, and I'm going to do exactly what's, what's written down now in the U's and the X's. But before that, things could go completely differently, and you wouldn't know it. Um, this one, as I mentioned, is often very poorly conditioned, and that's a bit of a downside of using that method. You need to be very careful when you optimize this objective to deal with the poor conditioning because of different views having such different influence on what happens. Another downside of this one is that, 
both this one and the one over there, it's not so clear how to initialize. Imagine you want a car to go from point A to point B. Well, what are the exact controls you need to apply? Maybe you can try to think through it's very hard. But that's all you get to initialize here, is the use or some policy. Here, you get to initialize the axis. If I want my car to go from point A to point B, and it's an empty space, I can just draw a straight line and say, well, probably the car cannot follow that straight line, but it might be able to follow something relatively close to that, and that might be a pretty decent initialization for the solution I'm trying to find. And so, because you have access to initialization of the axis, if you have any intuition of what the solution would look like, you can actually put it in initialization and often solve a problem that, maybe with a shooting method, because an elderly nonlinear problem might never found a solution, but here you have a lot of influence on how you set up the problem when you start out so that you might have uh, enough information to find a solution. Another upside of this one is it makes the computation stable by having a decoupling through the axis. Um, the main downside of this one here is that it might converge to a local optimum of the surrogate function that is not actually feasible. So you might end up with non-zero penalties and there's no way to improve and that's where you're at and you just now don't know what to do. Like you could try those sequence of controls and see what happens but you actually don't know um, based on just the objective that that's gonna be any good. And so you might get stuck in kind of a weird local optimum where you don't have any way to get out, and maybe you need to reinitialize and try again. Whereas here, if you are in a local optimum, you still know what is going to happen, because you know what the rollout is giving you. Now, of course, in this one, once you're in such a local optimum, you can do a rollout and see what happens, um, but um, it doesn't then give you anything to improve. So, another thing to point out is that the NPC, while probably most critical if you use this formulation, you can also use it here just as well, right? If you have a collocation method, you apply your first control, you resolve, repeat, and in fact, you often have to, because if there's noise in the execution, again, the original sequence of controls will not uh, be good. Question you might have is, um, how about iterative LQR? That's another method we saw to solve these kinds of problems. Where does that fall? Well, that falls over here. We're returning a sequence of linear feedback controllers. So returning a policy. Um, we do it with a shooting method in LQR because you kind of roll out the current policy, see what happens, backpropagate through all of that in a specific way, backpropagating with value iteration, but it's a backpropagation through everything to find an update and repeat. So iterative LQR falls here. It's kind of a, you can think of it as applying Newton's method if you were to apply Newton's method here, um, you'd see that essentially is it gonna be, or Gauss Newton's method is gonna be equivalent to LQR. Um, it's just that LQR is structured in a way that it understands every part of the structure of the problem, and so it takes advantage of that in a way that if you just ran a black box Newton method, it probably would not be nearly as efficient in this spot for the same problem as the iterative LQR. Now, if you want more than a linear feedback controller, it gets trickier, because LQR will not give you that you want a pi theta, that's a neural net, then you might still need to resort to just running Newton method or something like this, or some people will run LQR first and then behaviorally clone it. Say, okay, I now know my sequence of linear feedback controllers, now I'm gonna train a policy to be equivalent to those feedback controllers and find my policy that way. So let me show you, um, let's see, bring, actually any questions about this breakdown? Uh, I realize it's a, it's a lot and it's kind of not always clear which option to choose, but that's just the reality of, of the situation. And what I mostly want is to make you aware that there is all these formulations and you need to often carefully think for your problem which one you want to apply. Yes? Can you limit like how often the um, constraints are violated on the bottom left one? Like, let's say I only want like, oh, 5% of the time, I don't care if it violates these constraints. So in your penalty method, you could stop early if you want to. Um, and then that's what you could have. Um, you could, I mean, you could have an outer loop that says if less than 5% is violated, I'm just gonna run it. And I'm gonna run it in MPC mode anyway, and I hope it's good enough because the small violations won't affect me too much. And that's, that's a totally reasonable thing to do. Yes? When you're doing shooting and you're like calculating the forward pass, do you actually physically execute that on the robot or is it just um, 
Um, that's a good question. So um, what I described here was assuming you have access to the real dynamics and you, you run it in simulation. Um, in practice, that's not always the case, but often you'll build a model that hopefully is close. And so when you actually roll out on the real robot, you'll see discrepancies and you'll definitely need NPC or a feedback policy to be able to succeed. Um, there's also the notion that you could, in principle, optimize for a while in simulation, then you do a rollout on the real robot, and then you adjust your model F based on what you saw in that rollout. At that point, you'd be doing model-based RL in some sense, but you adjust the model F, and then optimize again against the new model and repeat. Yes? Um, yeah, correct. So we should start, yeah, good point. We should start in our optimization over x1, because x0 we don't get to choose. Absolutely right. And same here. Thanks. Okay, so let's, let's recap this into the slides, and then also look at a nice demo of a collocation method that has the exact behavior I described, just like make a car, follow a, find a path. Um, so this is a table we, ooh, wow, okay. Um, this is a table we had on the board. The third axis of choice was whether to do MPC during rollout or not. And when you optimize over just the use, you often will have to do it even during your optimization. Here's a specific incarnation of an algorithm. This is collocation plus open loop plus MPC. Um, that's what's set up over here, but you can do other things, of course. Um, we discussed the instability of open loop shooting. We discussed back progression through time being important to avoid duplicate computation. Um, then this is what it looks like in terms of equations. You would do a forward pass of your controls applied or your policy applied, and then you do you have essentially these derivatives, which should be a backward chaining of derivative calculations to get out all your gradients, uh, gradient entries that you need. And so it's not particularly expensive, it's just linear in the length of your sequence, whereas if you do it super naively, you get something exponential in the length of your sequence. Um, then we talked about pros and cons of shooting and collocation and how iterative LQR fits in. Now let's look at something that I still find pretty magical. Here we're going to do um, Collocation for finding a path where the cars go from bottom left to top right, then there's an obstacle. So the cost here is you have high cost if you're in collision with the obstacle. And the dynamics is that you need to satisfy the dynamics of the car. If we run collocation, we get to initialize this with linear interpolation between. So we kind of get a good hint at what we should have. Let's go right for the obstacle. But then there's cost associated with that. And there's penalty for violating the dy dynamics. And over time, it bends this path into a path the car can actually follow. And this actually works surprisingly well in many, many uh, domains, where you can just watch it again. You can just bend your solution, your initialization, into the actual solution. Um, well, in Two lectures from now, we'll see more detail about how you need to set up your cost function for collisions to make sure that it's not just 0, 1 in collision or not in collision, because then you don't get any signal. We need to set up a, a better shaped cost function for collision than just 0, 1. But if you do that, it'll actually push things out of collision and find a feasible path. And same for the dynamics of the car becoming satisfied. All right, that's it for today. See you next week.